Thank you, Father. And now, Mr. Kay, had I'm very sorry to no. interrupt. Here we go. In case you're wondering what this is, this is vodka. <laughs> it works miracles for the throat. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be with you tonight in this meeting, and I just hope that uh, I don't upset anybody from, from this program. I'm not comfortable with it. But I felt like that I needed to do it. It was not what I had planned to do originally. As I talked with Ms. Tunnel, originally I wanted to give you the mission of the Marine Corps in World War II and how that mission was carried out and the degree of success that took place. But I had the honor of working with students uh, on history facts and history areas, beginning in the middle school. I worked with middle school students, I worked with high school students, and also with college students. And it is a pleasure to work with these. I do it in classroom work, classroom shop. Many times I just invite them into our home and we listen to them and they come in twos and sometimes they come in one at a time. But it's such a pleasure to meet with these young people and listen to their stories and answer their questions and do what we can to help them in the historical area that they, that they don't live in. There's one particular <clears throat> area, one particular group that caused me to change this program for tonight. This is a senior class and two by two they came to our home and I spent a couple of hours with each two weeks of the, the groups and would answer their questions and try to guide them the best I could as to what took place in the time period which they did not live. But with this particular group, there's always a question at the close. And the question was, Mr. King Head, do you think World War II was necessary? I, I, I have a, in my office, I have a bookshelf with books, and I reach, reach up and get uh, a band of brothers. And I flip over and it says, Why We Fought. And I would read that to them and then give to them the conditions that existed when during that period of time in our history and why it was necessary for us to preserve the liberty and freedoms that we have, it was necessary for us to, to fight. The last student that came to our home was a young man who you could tell readily they would have loved the cut. He had a wonderful mind about him. He had his questions were very well put. And in the end, he, he too asked me a question. He said, Mr. Kinghead, can I ask you a question? I said, yes, sir, you can. But on the one condition that I'm able to ask you a question. And so I said, what is your question? He said, do you think World War II was necessary? And I said, son, I truly do. And I'm going to prove to you this night, I'm going to take your time, and I'm going to prove to you that it was necessary. Now, are you going to allow me to ask you a question? He said, yes, sir. I said, why do you, why did all your students, why you particularly, would ask me that question? Is that something that you came up with, mystery of your own? And he said, no, sir, no, sir. Our history teacher told us to ask because he did not believe that World War II was necessary. It was able to negotiate, if we were able to negotiate out, we would not have had the war. And the young man had some things that I jotted down in some of his statements. And I'm going to read them to you. This is what his teacher, history teacher, teaching our youth, okay? And this is what he said took place during World War II 
And he said, I can prove to you students that it wasn't necessary. Number one, such a waste, such a waste worldwide that we created. Hundreds of thousands of young men, and this is the teachers talking to the student body. Hundreds of thousands of young men died even before they were old enough to vote because of this war. Hundreds of thousands of them. He said hundreds of planes, thousands, I'm sorry, thousands of planes fell from the sky with the crew, landed on the earth or to the, on the seafloor. And that was a form of voice. He said four million tons of steel plus every every ship that went down went down with the crew it went down with tons and tons of diesel fuel and all the supplies that was in that ship and he said just think now somebody had to build those ships that were man hours many man hours we have one with us here tonight Rose of the Rivers here she built these ships and they went to the bottom of the sea, went to the sea floor and carried everything with them. He said, that's a waste. That's a waste in the way you put it. He said, think of the cities that were destroyed that had to be rebuilt. Think of the materials that were destroyed that were necessary now to rebuild and reestablish the cities that we as Americans destroyed. And he said that all products, all products that was consumed in World War II by the Americans, I can't verify this, I'm just quoting statements. The all product consumed would have lasted mankind 100 years had we not had the war. And he said, students, all of that is a waste. And I, I told this young man, I said, sir, I hear what you're saying. And you call it a waste. I have friends, young men, who I was in the Marine Corps with, trained for a year for a mission, and they battled to make it out of the water and were down the beach. And you call that a waste. Is that right, young man? He said, yes, sir, that's what we're told. For. I said, we have another term for it. We call it the price of liberty. Mm -hmm. The price of liberty. And every one of these young men you're talking about, they knew going in what might happen. Every one of them would have given their life if it was to restore liberty and guarantee freedom for this land that we love. Well, the young fellow and I had a lot of conversation. I think I disturbed him, but I, I, I showed him pictures that I had. I showed him and described some other things to him that took place during the war. And I said, do you understand? You are free today. You are free. You are liberty to make decisions in your life that otherwise you would not have made because of this waste factor that you keep introducing to our civilization, to our society. He says, I understand, and I hope that someday I understand what you're saying to me. Well, after he left, and I have a brother who retired <coughs> from Auburn University as a professor. <coughs> and I called him and I said, Ken, let me, let me share an experience with you I've had this evening. And I told him the story of what had happened. And I said, have you ever heard anything like this? He said, listen, don't blame that young school teacher for this. It's being taught 
and the most liberal universities around this land today that World War II was truly. And then he sent me a book. He said, I'm going to send you a book, and you understand when you read this book, the name of the book is A Century of War, and it's based on Lincoln, Wilson, and Roosevelt. Now, I'm not going to read you much out of this book because it's a disturbance. But in this book, Ernest Abe was not so earnest. Ernest Abe provoked the South to file on board something. He had the facts and... And this book was written by a circuit court judge. He lived in Opelika, lived in Opelika, Alabama. And not only was that, but both the Ernest Abe misled the people. He had to have a war because we were in a depression area in that period in history. And it felt like a war. And the best way to do this is to the economic conditions in the South are so much better than they are in the North because the North has to pay for everything they get and everything that's done for them. But the South has the slavery. And so they enjoy a life, a sumptuous life. And so Abe Lincoln, I'm, it's not me, it's in the book. And the old saying it's in the book. <laughs> Abe Lincoln says we got to stop that. And the only way I'm going to stop it is I'm going to declare all slaves to be free. The South will have to go to work. They'll have to spend some of that mountain of money that they have created, that wealth they have created. Well, that's, that's, I'm not going to linger too much here on this, but anyway, we go to, Wood, to Woodrow Wilson, World War II, or World War I, excuse me. World War I would have ended almost a year before it did end, because on Christmas Day, the Americans showed, you know, it was a trench warfare, you know, all for you with that. The Americans crawled out of the trenches, the Germans crawled out of their trenches, and they met on the field and they celebrated Christmas. Just had a wonderful time together. But no, the American generals found this out, and boy, they put everybody back in the trenches and said, we want to fight more. The war would have ended a year earlier. I've asked several people who, who know, who supposed to know that much about history, if this be a true fact. And they said, yes, it is a true fact. It is recorded in the Library of Congress in our country. But then let's move on quickly to Roosevelt. Roosevelt, as you know, uh, yes, I grew up on the farm, the Great Depression. I don't know how many of you had that privilege or not, but it was a difficult period of time for all of us. And in that time, I learned to appreciate President Roosevelt because we had what we call, have you ever heard of the five side chats? Have you ever heard that statement? Okay, we would listen to the old radio walking and squealing and listen to the five side shots. And what he would do is build up uh, enthusiasm into the people. And he had, he always said, we only have one thing to fear. And what is that? That's fear itself. Fear itself. He always closed the five side chats with that. And so I, I honored him. I always thought he was such a dynamic speaker. Uh, I, I have a book at home, it's called Lend Me Your Ears, is the title of the book. And what it is, is a book of speeches that have been made by mankind and the orators, and they are rated. And President Roosevelt was rated as number five, number the fifth best orator in the world. And so, I honored him. I remember the day he died. It was, I won't get into that story, but uh, it was a day that I remember because uh, I was hiding from an air raid and somebody told me that that day the president had died. 
I witnessed him one time when I was in high school at a place called Chipley, Georgia. You never heard of it, but it's uh, it's now Pine Mountains. But he was at Warm Springs and was coming across the mountain, and somehow it was was revealed to us, and we jumped on the school bus and we went up to the mountain, waited for the president to come over the mountain, and he pulled out a 36 model Ford. Have you ever seen it? It's one at, at, at uh, down at the museum. He pulled up. He was driving himself. The other thing it was down the way his hand. And he stopped and said, "How are you children doing?" And he chatted for just a minute and wished you all well. And he drove off. Of course, we were not at war at that time. The war was the furthest thing from our mind. But when he talked about Roosevelt, it was Roosevelt's war. He wanted a war. And he said, even though he said, I hate war, he knew that if he could create a war, then the depression would be far and long gone. So that's what's in this book. And I don't recommend that you read it unless you can't sleep at night and want to get mad and just just read it. Good boy. (laughs) Now let's change, let's change, let's change chapters. And I'm going to pull this watch off and I'm going to. That's the last thing my dear wife told me when I left. Remember, you know, don't to talk too much. And so, okay. But anyway, I want to. Negotiation was the answer. That is the answer to the liberalism today about World War II. We couldn't have negotiated our way out of it. Now I want to pull up the negotiation table here and let's look at the characters that we would be negotiating with. On our side of the table, we would have the United States, we would have Great Britain, and we would have Russia. Russia, I question. I never have honored Stalin because if you read history, he killed at least 40 million of his own people as he climbed to power when he threw over through the government and created communism in, in the country. On the other side of the table, we have Japan, we have Germany, and we have Mussolini from Hitler. These are the people that we would be negotiating with. Now the map of ceremonies on this side, of the left side of the table, is a guy named Hitler. Now let's look at Hitler. Hitler was a corporal in World War II, excuse me, World War I, in the army. So you never know, fellas, how much you're going to grow. Oh, you might have been low down on the pole, but you got an opportunity to grow. But anyway, he had an idea he was going to take over that country and he was going to free everybody except one race, and that was the race of the Jews. And so Hitler came to power. And the first thing he wanted to do, we would be negotiating with this now. How are you going to negotiate out of this? He would create a master race. Have you ever read that story? He would measure the head of these young people. He would measure their height. He would check their eyes and teeth and everything about them had to be perfect and they would become the fathers of the master race. Now, if you were unfortunate enough to be born into a family that had a low educational background, you know what would happen to you? It was sterilized. It was sterilized. You could not produce children that would follow your role in life. That was a man. Now, he was, no doubt, he knew how to muster up people. He knew how to, to somehow make people thrive on promises and live voices and so on. He even built two cities in South America, one in Argentina and one in, uh, in Brazil. And these cities, from these cities, he would control South America. He also built forts in Africa and he would control all of that part of the world through his forts that he had built. He was craving power. But I want to take this masturbation just one bit further, and I'm watching the watch. Thank you. 
If you remember, he was going to build a new Brazil, a new Berlin. You've read that, I'm sure. I have seen the drawings of some of the buildings and what was going to take place in New Berlin. The first thing that he was going to build, and he did build it, was a tremendous stadium. And that's where the 1936 World Olympics was held. Hitler had his main seat because his mass race was going to walk away with everything that could be had. But he overlooked one Indian boy from America named what? Jim Thorpe. What? Jim Thorpe and Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe. Yes, he was an Indian boy raised on a rebel reservation. His head had never been measured. His teeth had never been checked. His eyesight was never checked. But he walked away with everything and his master race walked away with nothing. Hitler gets mad, gets up, and leaves the state. And so, this is the guy that you would be negotiating with. Now, as he conquered these places in the world, look at Europe here, all of these places, when he would conquer them, there was a race of people that he had to give them the name, addresses, everything about them, and they would be rounded up. And six million of these people, he would put to death. And they were called Jews. Six million he would put to death. Also the gypsies. I'm sorry. He also did the gypsies. The gypsies. The gypsies. I was going to bring that out also. But the gypsies, he was down in what? Low Africa and upper part of Africa and places. Egyptians was one another race of people he wanted no part of, and they would be put to death. The gas chambers were built. The ovens were built. Uh, and if you, you've seen the pictures, I have a movie at home, the Nuremberg Trials. Some of you have seen it years ago, maybe recently. But I get it out sometimes just to see it. Just to see how wicked and how mean an individual can be. And it shows the great stadium. It shows the place where Hitler would stand and do all his loud talking. It also shows the ovens, the gas chambers, and it shows the new bodies of all these people that have been put to death buried in long trenches. Uh, if you've seen the movie uh, The Band of Brothers, have you, any of you ever seen that movie? In that, there's one thing, I don't know how they filmed it, and that was a prison, a Jewish prison that they freed and showed all the dead bodies that were just everywhere. Folks, I don't care how liberal you are. When you have to negotiate with a man like that, what can we expect? I do know this, that he signed a treaty with Japan. You all know that. If you look at history, you'll find it. He signed a treaty with Japan, and this was what you had to do. You keep America busy keep them out of Europe until I conquer England then together you and I will destroy America now that's not talk but it's in writing it's in writing and so can you understand my concern with these students being taught how we could negotiate our way out of the war it's not easy but it's factual. The facts are there. And I hope that someday that the wall can come together. Yes, there was a lot of waste. Yes, we saw a lot of folks die. Yes, we saw a lot of destruction. But again, I say, we say it, it's the cost of freedom. It's the cost of just freedom. 
and happiness that we enjoy today. I do know this for a fact. And I went to England and I studied this part of it. Germany had already picked, Hitler had already picked the German general who was going to control England, or Great Britain. And that general made a, a silent landing, secret landing, on the northern part of Great Britain just to observe the British people, their habits, and so on. And he was going to take control. And I've asked this young student that we had that night, and I asked him, how would we have, what, when we were negotiating, what would we give away? What would we promise? And he said, I guess we would promise that we would not destroy Hitler. Or not to. So why? Why should we destroy it? It's damnation to human souls and beings. It's not a life that we could live. It's not a life that we want to live. But we got, well, on and on we could go. But I hope you understand that some of us are concerned about what's being taught to students today. And I want to go back where we started, okay? My time's about up. I want to go back where we started. There's another thing that's taking place in this land now that really disturbs me. And that is that there's a feeling that the Constitution of this land has outlived this purpose. Are you reading that? Are you hearing that? Well, the Constitution of this land is just like the Ten Commandments. They never outgrow for the time. The Constitution of this land guarantees freedom. And now some of our people in places of leadership are saying, we can't abide by the Constitution exactly because it's out there this time. If that be true, <coughs> if that be true, then we are in trouble. Maybe not just you and I, but look at your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, what you wanted to pass on to them, the way of liberty and freedom and happiness choice of life, choice of education, choice of profession. It didn't matter whether your father or mother could read or write. It doesn't matter. The child has it, he has deserved the right to be given the chance. Please don't let us destroy the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. I know they say now a lot of things can be done with executive order, but that, that's misleading. It's terribly misleading. And though some of you, in closing, let me remind you, some of you have studied the Roman Empire. It's a marvelous study. It was a marvelous country, a marvelous nation, a marvelous civilization in its early days. It had a Caesar. Caesar was in charge of the army. It had a, had a senate who was in charge of all the local manpower, family affairs, and so forth in that country. And then you had the engineering grants. Marvelous buildings that they built. Marvelous ideas they came up with. You're still discovering even today some of the great things that this, these engineers developed. If you go to Caesarea by the sea, some of you probably have been there, you can see the ruins of what was a harbor that was dug out of the sands and beaches of that, of that area. They needed a harbor, and so they did develop one. They brought water down out of the mountains from miles and miles away, and they brought it through these aqueducts, and you've seen pictures of them. Each one of those things, they didn't have computers, they didn't have levels that we have today. 
But each one of those aqueducts could only drop just so little so that the water was gracefully moving toward its destination. And when it came to Rome, there was so much water in Rome. That's why you have so many fountains in Rome today. They had so much waste, so much water to waste. All of that was good. But here comes Nippo, I mean, uh, <clears throat> we call him the Nutty Nippo. He said, we do not need the Senate. They have no place in our civilization today. So he wanted, he did away with the Senate. He did away, I take, I control everything. I'm the man of power. I know what I want is best for this country, and I'll, I'll do what's best for this country. So the Senate was served. Please don't let that happen to us. Our forefathers gave us a government with three branches. And neither power, not, neither one of them, has the power over the other one. It's to give us a solid, rounded way of life and protection in this land. But now they're saying it's out there this time. And my prayer, and I hope it's your prayer, <laughs> that we will gain wisdom and that wisdom will prevail and and we can pass on to those yet unborn the great land that we have in this country. I thank you very much, and I, I know I have... Can you make a comment, please? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. As a reply to that young liberal man that you just quoted a while ago, was war is necessary. No war is necessary if everybody would get together. But that is not going to happen. Our Bible tells us that wars and rumors of wars. There's never been a We've got to remember, had it, been not, had it not been for Pearl Harbor, there would have been not a Nagasaki. And we've not fought World War II in Europe. We'd be speaking German today. Correct. Eat sauerkraut and love it. Yeah. So what's in the place? <laughs> I tell you, you're so right. You're so right. I just read this this week. We did not declare war on Germany first. Germany declared war on us falling for a while. Falling for a while. And I told this young fellow, I said, People standing on the beach in Jacksonville, Florida. I know this is true. I picture it up. Standing on the beach, saw a German submarine sink one of our ships here that rose to the river to have built, loaded with supplies, headed for the, for the canal. They witnessed this ship struggling, and we could do nothing about it. Okay. We can do nothing about it. I also, I said, do you remember? You don't remember, but have you heard that January the 1st, 1942, that the Rose Bowl game was moved from Pasadena, California, to Duke University? And he said, why was that? I said, because the Japanese submarine was throwing up and down our coast, and they could shell a stadium from, from, from the sea. There were also, said there were also uh, planes were releasing incendiary, uh, not bombs, but sure. fire. There were a lot of fires in California from the Japanese planes. They built six submarines that had hangers on it, but two small planes, almost like, maybe smaller than Cubs that we know today. And she's right. They had incendiary bombs on them, and they would fly in and try to start a fire. That's what they wanted to do. Uh, yes, sir. I don't care much for uh, what else history, but I can give you an argument that uh, World War II was not necessary. Uh, but it goes back to uh, 1919 and 1920. Well, you're saying it's a continuum of World War One. If, if they had treated the Germans a little better, 
in the peace negotiations, settlements, they wouldn't have been a Madoff Hitler and they wouldn't have been World War II. But, but that's what happened, you know. They, Dance, so. Well, you're right. Some historians are saying that World War II started back in World War One. Uh, World War One was a continuation of World War One, a 20-year break. Yeah, that's right. Well, Germany was an extremely deep depression. I mean, the people had no food or anything, and Hitler promised them that he would make things better, and that's where he got his start. And they believed him. People were very oh. despondent. You get a much better job at the end of World War II. You, you cannot doubt, you cannot doubt the intelligence, the wisdom of the United Nations. They were the first jet fuel, they were the first jet plane, they were first rockets, they were first, they were brilliant people. <coughs> they were, and, and I have, I knew I stood in Berlin one day and talking with a gentleman and I said, if you had used all that energy to build a world, what would you, what would this world be like? He said, that's the way, that's not the way you do it. You have to scrap, fight, break, tear, and, and, and read a bell. I know I haven't said things nice tonight, and I know that, but it has troubled me. I have talked to some of my friends about it here tonight, about this very same thing that, that occurred. But I just don't want us to... War? Who, who, who likes war? Nobody likes war. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps. It's 10 of us that were sworn in. And then, of course, it was part of the Navy at that time. And ten of us were sworn in at the Navy building in Atlanta. When the war ended, two of us came home. <laughs> so you see how destructive it can, it can be. And minds and hearts were destroyed forever. A young fellow named Knowles who came home when I did, six months later he committed suicide. His life was, was never right. Uh, I regret that I did not try to stay in touch with Knowles, but those of you who are veterans know it was a struggle when you came home to try to settle down, and try to get an education, and try to make a living, and try to do things. It was, I created, I had a wonderful case of ulcers, migraine headaches, I had all those things that go along with it. But I still regret that I did not try to contact Knowles. But he didn't get the help that I received at home. I know or he wouldn't have committed suicide. So there's no end to all this. Uh, it's this, I'm gone, okay. Over in Tennell, Georgia, I had a friend that joined the Marine Corps when I did. We became close friends. Uh, I remember we were on the island of Guam when he got to notice that his one brother had been shot down, shot down over Germany. Well, he was shook up about it, yes, but he said there's still two of us. He did not know that his middle brother was killed five days before he was on Iwo Jima. His body came home two years later and his mother wanted me to come to the funeral, and I and I went. And when I walked up to the cemetery, I'll never forget the scene. There were one, two, three graves side by side, three brothers. And in each headpiece, there was a porcelain picture of that boy in his headpiece, in his uniform. And my friend, who's a member of the Marine Corps League here in Rome, would happen to be in Tunnel earlier this last year, and he made a photo, went out to the cemetery and made a photograph, and those porcelain pictures were just as clear as it was 70 years before that. Mm -hmm. That's what war does for us, it destroys us. But you're right, you're right. As long as man is what he is, 
there's going to be hatred, there's going to be greed, there's going to be a lot of things that turn us to killing, that create wars. You've got neighbors, you'd like some, much better than you do others. You've got some neighbors, dogs where you and, and you just almost go to war over, over the neighbor's dog. That's it. Until we find a way to absorb all of this and come out smiling, we'll have war. Thank you so much.